Okay, can you hear me? Great. So um, this is a joint work with Christian Du, Chatterjee, Amir, Kafdarko, Harsadi, Rasmus Ibsen, Jensen, uh, and myself, all coming from IST Austria. So let me start by uh, giving you where our work stands in the big picture. Um, a typical paradigm for, for program analysis is to uh, take some you know, analysis problem and reduce it to some standard graph problem, P, uh, by means of the following procedure. Then we, first we have um, um, uh, um, the program as an input, we extract its control flow graph, we annotate it with some um, annotations that are um, um, relevant for our problem, um, and then we run some uh, general graph algorithm for on the control flow graph for solving this uh, problem P. Um, and our work in, um, um, focuses on the third step of this process. In particular, we bring some algorithmic improvements for uh, solving some uh, graph problem that uh, is frequently used in this scheme. And we do so by um, exploiting the special structure that control flow graphs of programs typically has. So instead of having a general algorithm, we have some um, dedicated one for the task. Um, our uh, target application domain is uh, static uh, data flow and quantitative analysis for concurrent systems, where a system consists of a collection of con control flow graphs from the local threads, plus some synchronization variables that um, uh, you might track. And a node of the concurrent system then specifies what the local state of every component is, plus the synchronization, and the whole system transitions with respect to um, uh, interleaving semantics. Um, we assume that the annotations come from a uh, complete and closed semiring, which can be used to express a variety of properties, such as uh, generalized reachability, distributive uh, data flow analysis problems, where the domain of the semiring is, is the set of flow functions, um, quantitative analysis problems, where we use um, real numbers to, to, to capture quality measures or um, you know, um, quantitative properties, uh, and others. Um, to be a bit more formal, we have a complete closed semiring with domain sigma, the two usual semiring operators and their uh, corresponding uh, neutral elements, and a collection of a fixed number k of, of uh, local control flow graphs, GI, each one has size n, which together compose a concurrent system, which we also depict as a, as a, as a graph. Um, so the nodes of this graph are tuples, which specify the local state of every component. So I'll, I won't be tracking synchronization variables to keep it simple, but the results that I present apply also when you have some few number of synchronization variables. Um, and the transition relation of this uh, system uh, comes from the product of the uh, local transition relations of the, of the um, um, control flow graphs of the local components. So a transition looks like this. It takes a tuple and then gives you another tuple, which says that you know, if, if, if thread i is in, in state ui, it can go to state vi. Um, and on top of that, we have a weight function, which maps every transition to uh, some value of the domain of the semiring. And I should stress that this is a global weight function, so to, to obtain this value, we need to examine um, all the transitions taken by the, the components. Uh, now, as usual, a trace or a path of the system is, is a finite sequence of, um, of nodes. Um, and we obtain the weight of such a path by uh, combining the weights that we see along its transitions using the same uh, times operator. Fine, so now the problem that we are interested in is computing semiring distances, where a semiring distance from a node U to a node V um, of the system is taken to be the semiring plus of all the weights um, uh, of paths that go from U to V. Right, to uh, illustrate this with an example, we have here two, two threads and their uh, control flow graphs. Uh, nodes, in this case, of the concurrent system are, are pairs. So this node specifies that the first um, uh, component is in, in, in state two and the second one is in, in state seven. A transition gives you know, a, a local step for every, for every component. And the weight function will, will take this transition of the global system and, and give it some value from the semiring. Um, now, the semiring distances that we, we um, are interested in come in, in forms of in the pair queries, which are asked, uh, in this case, what is the semiring distance from node 1, 1 to node 7, 7. Um, now, the existing algorithmic approach for, for this problem, and, and by algor algorithmic, I mean um, an approach that is general and doesn't make any further assumptions about the structure of the input, um, 
is to uh, take these control flow graphs of the two components, take their product, G, and then uh, use some uh, um, standard transitive closure algorithm uh, to do an all pairs computation on the, on the, on the product graph. Um, and this operation has cubic complexity, but note that our size is already um, n squared because of the product, so the overall time taken in this case is a, is a polynomial of, uh, is a hexic polynomial. So it's rather an inefficient proce procedure. Um, our work uh, provides some um, algorithmic improvements for, for, this, uh, for this problem um, by assuming that the component uh, graphs have some special structure. In particular, they are low three-width graphs. Now, uh, um, three-width is, is um, a quantity, uh, uh, a positive integer that measures how similar a graph is to a tree. And we know that uh, control flow graphs of most programs have typically small tree width, which means that they look to some extent like trees. Now, uh, exploiting this property, our first contribution is, is a faster algorithm for computing the transitive closure. In particular, we can do so for two components in almost quartic time instead of uh, hexic time. And the second contribution is to show that we can explore this tree width to um, um, obtain on-demand analysis. Now, in on-demand analysis, the goal is to, instead of uh, solving the all pairs problem, um, we want to spend only some time pre-processing our input so that afterwards, when we are presented with uh, a number of uh, distance queries, we can answer them in reasonable time using the information we, we uh, um, computed during the pre-processing phase. Um, and what we saw is that um, uh, if you only need to answer a few queries, you don't w need to take the transitive closure. And, uh, uh, in fact, uh, we offer a range of, of trade-offs between pre-processing and query time, uh, which um, uh, um, is, 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 is tailored to on-demand analysis d depending on the number of queries that you need to solve your problem uh, for. Um, this is better il illustrated with, uh, uh, in the case of two components, the product, as I said, has size n by n times n, and the transitive closure has n to the four entries. Uh, and now, the existing algorithmic approach needs to take the transitive closure even for one instance of the problem, in, even for a, for a single pair query, and will do so in, in hexic time. Whereas, as I said, we can compute the transitive closure in almost quartic time, and then if we're presented with i queries afterwards, we simply, um, it's, it's query cost a table lookup, so we spend order i time to answer all of those. So the total time spent is the sum of the two, pre-processing and query time. And we only need to do so much pre-processing if we uh, need to solve the problem for, for a large number of instances, uh, at least uh, cubically many. Uh, whereas if you, if you want to solve the problem for fewer instances, say between almost linear and almost cubic, uh, you can save a factor um, n in the pre-processing time, so instead of n to the four, you go to n to the third, at the expense of a factor n increase in the query time. And if you expect even more, say almost linearly many, uh, you can get rid of this uh, uh, epsilon in the exponent and increase your query time by another factor n. Uh, additionally, these upper bounds uh, come with some optimality statements. First, observe that the uh, um, transitive closure takes time almost linear in the size of the output since the, it, it anyway has to output a table of size n to the four. So there's not much room for further improvement here. And on the other spent of the um, other end of this uh, spectrum, um, we saw that this upper bound is, is conditionally optimal, meaning that you cannot hope to improve it unless you refute some long-standing uh, conjecture in graph theory. Uh, so this is a flavor of our results. You can look in the paper for more and also what happens in the case of more than two components. Um, I will now move on and give you a high-level overview of the steps that we follow in, in order to obtain these this, uh, this complexities. So I will talk about 3D compositions and what happens in the case of the concurrent system how 3D compositions can be used for on-demand analysis and conclude with some uh, experimental results. So, let me give you an idea of what a 3D composition is. Given a graph G on the left, a 3D composition of this graph is, which we call tree of G, is another graph on the right, which, as the name suggests, is a tree. And the nodes of this tree are called bugs uh, and are subsets of nodes of the original graph. So, for example, this bug here, uh, contains nodes 8, 9, and 10 of the original graph. Um, and the, um, uh, conceptually, what's going on, um, the, the property that we use in order to you know, obtain these this, uh, improved complexities 
um, is a so-called separator property, which states that if you take any bug in this uh, 3D composition, say this one, this one splits the tree into a number of components, in this case a top one and a bottom one. Um, now if you take any two nodes that appear in different components, for example node 10 here from the upper component and 6 from the lower component, you're guaranteed that all paths from 10 to 6 uh, will go uh, through um, some node that appears in this bug. In this case, we know that all paths from, from 10 to 6 have to go through node 7. Um, and one can use this property to prove that, you know, if you want to now comp compute the sending distance from 10 to 6, uh, you just have to uh, like label your bugs along the path um, in the tree between the bugs that um, uh, these nodes appear in. Um, and you know that you can find an a, a node x1 that appears in b1 and b2, and then a node x2 that appears in b2 and b3, such that uh, the semiring distance from 10 to 6 can be obtained by first getting the semiring distance from 10 to x1. So these are two nodes that both appear in back one. Uh, multiply that by the semiring distance from node x1 to x2. These are two nodes that both appear in bug two, you see here. Uh, and finally, take the semiring distance from x2 to 6, and these again are two nodes that appear in the same bug, B3. Which means that you can uh, compute semiring distances if you have at your disposal a 3D composition of the graph and you have already compute local distances within every, inside every bug, so you already know the semiring distances between every pair of nodes in the bug. Um, why is this relevant to us? Um, we know that control flow graphs of um, typical imperative programs have 3D compositions of small sized bugs. So um, the tree width of, of a family of graphs is, is an upper bound on the size of the bugs of 3D compositions that we can construct uh, when taking graphs from that family. So we know, for example, that uh, if we have go to free programs uh, uh, from Pascal, then this will give uh, control flow graphs where the tree width of, of tree width at most four. This means that no matter how large the control flow graph becomes, you can always construct a 3D composition where the size of the bugs is, is no, no, each bug is not larger than four. In case of C, there's another uh, theoretical upper bound, which is seven. And we also know, you know, in practice, that even if you do have go-tos and, and you uh, uh, examine other, other languages, um, the tree width of these control flow graphs doesn't increase in practice, you know, at least as long as the program has been written by a human. Um, and this is good because even though uh, the computing a 3D composition of a graph is a, an NP-complete problem, it is known that for constant with graphs, when you are guaranteed that, that the size of the bugs is not large, uh, you can get a 3D composition in, in linear time, so very fast. Fine. Uh, unfortunately, in our case, uh, uh, this uh, does not solve all our problems. The point is that uh, even though we have constant uh, tree width control flow graphs from the local components, this doesn't guarantee that the tree width of the whole system is small. And in fact, this is not the case. Uh, this is a very simple illustrative example. If you take two streamlined control flow graphs, each one has tree width one, uh, but their composition will give a grid which has tree width n minus one. So the tree width increases. Uh, much, uh, and in this case, uh, it's, it's a bit hopeless to try to get a, an optimal 3D composition uh, because this is an intractable problem for when you don't have a, a constant upper bound on the uh, size of the bugs. Um, so at the heart of our approach lies, lies an algorithm which is uh, fast and computes a 3D composition of, of, of the concurrent system, even though this might not be um, um, an optimal one. It's, it's good enough for our purposes. Um, and we do this by uh, means of a two-step process. First, um, we used some standard algorithms for obtaining uh, uh, 3D compositions of the local components. Uh, since these are low tree-width graphs, we know that we can do that fast. But these algorithms will, will speed out some tree of arbitrary shape. And now uh, what we need to do is bring some more structure in this tree uh, which, which allow for our algorithms later on to, to, to um, run in, in reasonable time. So first of all, we need to turn these trees to um, uh, binary ones, so every bug has two, um, two children, a left one and a right one. Um, and uh, these trees are, are also strongly balanced, which means that if, if a bug has n descendants, then these n descendants will be um, 
almost equally distributed in the left and the right uh, child of this bug. So half of these descendants will be descendants of the right, right child, and the other half will be descendants of the left child. Um, and now, um, given these uh, strongly balanced 3D decomposition for, um, uh, for the local graphs, um, we have a simple uh, linear time proce procedure for obtaining a 3D decomposition for the whole uh, system. And because of this uh, strongly um, balanced property, what we obtained is that in this 3D decomposition of the concurrent system, the root is a large bug of size order n. And as you move one level below, the size of the bugs uh, uh, decreases by half. So uh, as, you, as you move along a path from the root to the leaves, the size of these bugs forms a, 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 geomet a geometrically decreasing, uh, a decreasing geometric series. Um, so fine. We ha at this point, we have a 3D decomposition, so we solve the first of our problems. Now how ca can we use it to uh, compute semering distances? Um, Recall that our task is to compute local distances, meaning that for every pair of nodes that appear together in some bug, uh, we need to compute their semering distance. You know? and, and even if the, the nodes appear in the same bug, this distance might be witnessed by paths that go outside this bug and visit other nodes. However, um, one can prove that um, if you traverse this tree in, um, in a particular way and perform transitive closures locally in each bug, this is good enough. So first you start with the leaves, you compute a transitive closure locally on this graph, you go to the next leaf, and so on, and then you move further up the tree, and um, this is a procedure that um, eventually, when it terminates, you will have uh, computed all lo local distances between uh, pairs of nodes in, in the bugs. So instead of taking the transitive closure in the whole system, you, ha you have taken many transitive closures in, in smaller graphs, uh, and because of uh, the size of the bugs it decreases geometrically on the levels, then so does the, um, the, the cost for the uh, transitive closures. And the time spent on this whole operation is dominate, dominated by the uh, time spent on the root, which is the largest one. And this is great news because the, the, the root has size n instead of n squared. Right? So um, the time that we have spent is only cubic instead of hexic that would have been if we had taken the transitive closure on the whole graph. Um, and this is uh, good enough for the um, uh, leftmost uh, point in our uh, preprocessing spectrum. So after cubic uh, time by uh, computing local distances as I just showed you, you can answer queries in each one in quadratic time. Um, now if you want to answer queries faster, you need to do some, to follow some additional steps which I'm not going to explain um, what you can ask me afterwards. Um, instead, I will move on to some experiments that we conducted um, using our algorithms. So what we did, the, the basic setup is as follows. We extracted control flow graphs of methods from Java libraries and benchmarks. And you know, since we, we tackled our algorithmic problem here, we didn't engineer some particular data flow analysis problem. Instead, we focused on, on taking the transitive closure uh, with respect to a tropical mean plus semi-ring, so essentially we computed shortest paths. Um, in the first line of experiments, um, there is no real concurrency involved. We simply extracted control flow graphs from programs from the DACAPO benchmark sheet. And um, for every such graph, we took the, uh, the product with itself. So we created a graph of uh, size n by n. Um, we assigned random weights in these graphs, in this range, from minus 1,000 to 1,000. Uh, we took care that there are no negative cycles. Uh, and we tested um, the um, efficiency of our algorithms uh, computing, in computing the transitive closure as compared to the baseline method, which is the standard Bellman-Ford algorithm. Um, and this is the um, result that we obtained. So on the x-axis, we have uh, the size of these graphs of whose the product we took. So this is n. Uh, and on the y-axis, we have the time that uh, the transitive closure operation requires. So as you can see, the baseline method it scales very, very poorly and, and starts timing out very fast, uh, even for s relatively small graphs. Whereas um, in our case, um, I mean, uh, our method scales much better, and, and it had no problem uh, handling even, even larger graphs. Um, in the second line of experiments, we actually considered uh, control flow graphs of, of uh, uh, concurrent programs. So we extracted control flow graphs from container methods in the concurrent library of Java. 
So th these are methods that perform uh, operations on concurrent data structures. Uh, and we only focused on methods that, that use logs as, they syn as their uh, synchronization primitive. And so what we did was uh, blow up the control flow graphs of these programs with the value of the logs so that we make sure um, um, uh, that uh, concurrency is modeled correctly. And again, we took the two self product of a method with itself. So this, this models, you know, two copies of the same method running in parallel. Again, assigned uh, random weights in this range and computed the transitive closure. Um, and um, these are the results that we get. Uh, qualitatively, the figure is the same. We have, you know, the baseline method that again uh, scales poorly and then times out very fast. So this is a graph of size about 70 and uh, Bellman Ford here times out even after um, eight hours. Uh, whereas, you know, in our case, um, uh, the scalability is much, much better, which gives us some confidence, you know, that um, uh, not only uh, our theoretical upper bounds are much better, but also uh, these things work in practice. So we hope that uh, we can use these this new algorithmic methods to actually engineer real world um, static analysis problems. Uh, and this concludes my talk. Thank you.